Star Trek The Next Generation was a show Star Trek The Next that Generation everybody was I interacted with. A show that I started watching when I was a really little kid. Can you believe it's been 30 years? Star Trek The Next Generation first Star Trek The Next Generation was my life. I really grew up with this show. My relationship to how I should conduct myself. It was the escape from reality. Welcome to Next Generation's First Generation, where Patrick Delmore and Sasha Shouties take a look back into their favorite childhood show, Star Trek The Next Generation. This is where we attempt to reconcile how we felt as children watching the show and looking back as old farts now in our late 30s, almost 40s. Guests? social commentary, and good old-fashioned shade-throwing on our favorite and least favorite episodes. Here comes Patrick and Sasha. Oh, I almost forgot. This is a watch-along podcast, so make sure to queue up your favorite DVD or Netflix, and we'll give you the countdown of 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 to uh, basically watch along with the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Next Generation's First Generation. I'm your host, Sasha Shouties, and with me I have the lovely Patrick Delmore. Oh, thank you so much for calling me lovely. It's great to be here. Mm Mm-hmm. You're my brother from another mother. Aw. Uh, And then also we have with us our good friend, Nigel. Hey, everyone. And we are here to watch a very fun episode, Conspiracy. So what do we remember about Conspiracy, Patrick? They never made another episode of Star Trek anything like this episode. Yeah, this... It is a, almost an anomaly of an episode of Star Trek. It's an outlier. This is this is more your classic standalone sci-fi script. Yeah. Uh, I like it. It's dark. Uh, we have some very interesting... Uh, We have some very interesting uh, things to talk about in this uh, storyline, but... Needless to say, uh, when it was pitched, Gene Roddenberry had uh, an idea of where he wanted it to go, and it turned into something else. Uh, So, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Um, We are at play pause, so go ahead and queue up, get it all ready. I'm going to give you the countdown. Five, four, three, two and play and there's Riker doing his log they're on their way to Pacifica now you're going to notice a lot of like leg models in the uh, skirt uniforms in this episode like an adornment in that Jordy is telling uh Data a uh, sex joke, <laughs> and their their bosses, or rather Jordy's boss um, and Riker, are sitting there watching this go on, and they're like, "That's fine at work." <laughs> Is he gonna laugh? Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. We all need a friend like that who's going to laugh at our jokes or try to laugh at our jokes even when they're bad. Oh, I love Data. It's like... Look, look, <laughs> proud Papa and proud Mama. <laughs> yes. And Troy's like, yes, we live We live in a world now where women are not offended by jokes like this. Wow. That was actually one of the complaints from the women working on this show was a lot of the scenes were male dominated and that there was only one woman there and not more than more than two you can swim in the moonlight nope swimming is like taking a bath <laughs> Klingons don't do it swimming, swimming is too much like bathing I bet you he doesn't dance in the rain either no. yeah, too much like a shower a code 47 So it comes. So any helmsman could have gotten that code forty-seven. So I can only imagine that on the bridge, everybody gets to see Picard's 
uh, bedroom <laughs> there on the screen. No, it looked like Riker was in his office, not on the bridge. But nevertheless, everybody on the bridge knows that a Code 47 came in. Understood. Several characters we don't know. Turn off that damned light. <laughs> it's his personal relaxation light. They only talked about that once. I always wanted to see that light. They're old buddies. So it's a slow opening, but we have a confidential con- a confidential email email uh, communicate coming in. Now this show originally, uh, so it's called conspiracy, and so what is the conspiracy, Patrick? When when a group of people within more than three more than three people have share a secret, it's a conspiracy. That's right, and and then that secret usually has a motive, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The original pitch to this show was that there was a faction within Starfleet to uh, work against the interests of. The rest of the Federation. And uh, when that idea was pitched, uh, it was quickly thrown out because they felt that they didn't want to portray the Federation in that way. Uh, which is really interesting because then you look at the about face that Deep Space Nine did with Section 31. Well, Gene Roddenberry was dead, dead, dead when uh, Deep Space Nine came on the air. That's right. There are a lot of people that don't like Deep Space Nine because it's not. Gene's vision for what uh, Star Trek was supposed to be. True, true. Okay, so here we go. We're into the credits. Uh, like I said, this is Conspiracy, episode number 24, production code 125, original air date, May 9th, 1988. So, I hope you're having a wonderful May 9th day, that the sun is shining, and that happiness is sprinkling upon you. Uh, while this is a time traveling uh, assumption that all is well on the release date, the episode was directed by Cliff Boyle, story by Robert uh, Sabaroff, telepa- teleplay by Tracy Torme. I can never say that name right. Featured music by Dennis McCarthy, and cinematography by Edward R. Brown. We have lots of guests. Uh, we have. Um, our gentleman Robert uh, Skenkin as Lieutenant Commander uh, Dexter Remig, uh, who I actually really liked. We had Ward Costello. He's our Admiral Quinn. Uh, and the list goes on and on, and we'll, we'll do highlights as they come up. Yeah, for an episode that doesn't have Ron Jones music, the music of this is actually really good and really evocative. I would have to agree with that. This story originally started with one sentence from Gene Roddenberry, which turned into a memo called Assassins. Uh, So to give you the timeline, uh, they pitched it in February 3rd of 1988, and then went from memo to a 10-page draft to a 30-page script... And then they went to a three-page memo of script notes, and then it was revised and rewritten, and they finally went into recording the score on April 29th. Um, and eventually, somewhere in there, they filmed it, and then they had the air date of May 9th. So that's not bad. February, March, April, three-month turnaround on one and it's episode. it's already a conspiracy now because Picard has diverted the ship, uh-huh. Riker, Worf, Data, Jordy, uh, Data, they all know. And Troy, his uh, his resident psychic, knows something's up. You think everybody else would know something's up, too? Yeah, far. but she, you know, knows things on a deeper level. Ditalis B. The mining planet. Thank you for accessing Wikipedia for us, Data. Ditalis B is the fifth of six planets. There's another... <laughs> Model. Short, short, yep. skirt. <laughs> it's what they used to call window dressing back in 1988. All apologies to our female audience. Are there any 
minor or indigenous life form from the planet? I still would have to say that being the info guy on the show is kind of cool. Where your job is just to research and report out and and let Riker or the other decision makers know what's going on. So, if Data remembers everything that he's ever read, doesn't he, won't he reach a point where he would never have to access the uh, Enterprise computers for information at all? True. Well, Unless maybe, something... maybe he'd delete stuff he doesn't deem necessary anymore. I could see that, yeah. yeah. Like, after Dixon Hill, did he really need to retain all the Pulp Fiction detective stuff? Well, he decided he wanted to focus on the Holmes mm-hmm. stories. So, yeah, I could see him just dumping the up in the 1930s things. Mm-hmm. Here's the uh, first mention of an ambassador class ship, by the way. So, to answer your question about the memory dump, think of it the other way. Uh, I've heard stories of people who cannot forget things. They have uh, the, the photographic memory. And they say they wish they could remember phone numbers from 20 years ago. Because it's just stuff they don't... Yeah. It's just information they don't need. <laughs> that's nice lighting there. Yeah. That's all right. That's, this is a, a, S, a, this a, a light. standard uh, standard uh, definition we're watching. Yep, and it looked just the same. This one looked just the same in high definition. I watched the high definition version this morning. Nice. I haven't watched this episode in probably about a year. This is a really cool group of people that he meets here, and I would love to read some books about who these other folk are. Yeah, we never really see him again. Because it's like he got the female counterpart to Captain Picard, who's like the fastest, the... She's like the fastest person ever to become a captain in Starfleet is in here. You know who she reminds me of is Michelle Burnham? Michael Burnham, Or Michael Burnham, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's our first bullion. Who is not blue. Although that is fixed for uh, the HD version. Is it? Is yeah. he blue in HD? Yeah. yeah. He's not like blue screen blue, but he's tinted blue. Nice. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Why are they all pointing weapons at us? Yeah. At me. Now is that sl- is the Bolian is that sloth from the Goonies? Ooh no. Okay. No. Your life. So they're doing a a, a a loyalty check. Not a loyalty check. They're trying to verify his identity with some with some important uh, backstory because mm-hmm. they're asking about how um, Jack and Beverly Crusher met one another. <laughs> now. Um, Again, I will steer people to the excellent uh, autobiography of Jean-Luc Picard that just came out at the end of last year to uh, learn some of, learn about some of the stuff they're talking about here. It really syncs up well with this episode, and this episode is talked about quite a bit in that book. What's fun about that book is that it, for a lot of it, assumes, like, you've watched Star Trek The Next Generation. So they tell you about Picard's life before and after the show took place. Mm. He'll do a little bit extra notes on some of the stuff that happened in some episodes. But yeah, the assumption is you know those stories. We're going to tell you what it, stuff about the guard you don't know. Yeah. So this is where the plot diverges. So originally, this was supposed to be a Iran Contra uh, controversy critique. And uh, they didn't go that direction. Um, we're, we're still setting up the air of mystery of what's going on. Um, there are strange things afoot, uh, evacuations, crew reassignments. And they're just kind of giving their history, uh, their case history of why something's up. And if you remember about six episodes ago in Coming of Age... There was also an investigation by uh, the Admiral, which we'll see in this episode, and Remick uh, investigating a threat to the Federation, but they never really kind of touch on what that is. 
once in the Starfleet's top command people are changing. This could affect the very core of our organization. So, building a lot of mystery. Now, did either of you... Do you guys remember the first time you ever saw this episode? I saw it pretty recently. Okay. I do not recall watching this episode. For the first time. Yeah, it's it doesn't stick in my mind very well. I remember watching the last few minutes of this episode Everybody as a child. Everybody remembers the last few minutes. Because, yeah. I mean, watching someone's head explode with a phaser is just like, this is great! But this is a slow act right here. Yeah, it gave me uh, it gave me nightmares for sure. The end of this episode, oh, really. This would this would have gotten me like right when it, now what they're showing is like this red tint and just adults talking very seriously would not have kept me engaged as a youngster. But I I really remember the end of the episode. I must have, I'm sure I was younger than ten the first time I saw it. I don't think I watched it right when it aired because that might have been a I'm never coming back moment for me as a six year old. Really? <laughs> yep. I'm having a hard time just staying awake for this scene. It's kind of making me bored. I just, you know, I'm just not a fan of speculative dialogue, I guess. Especially when you introduce these characters that could be really interesting. It would be fun if they came back. None of them do. Yeah, no. Uh, The Bolian might still be alive. I don't know. Um, These other two uh, don't make the end of the episode this guy's not going to make it through uh I, i've got something scene. i've got something in the show notes for that bully in there um i have to look it up did did we say what what his name was captain ricks right yeah Something like that. yeah okay well he is a goofy looking dude uh so his name is uh michael B- uh berryman uh he's uh about 69 years old now, so when this came out, he was in his uh, 20 years ago. 30 years ago. So he was about almost 40. Yeah. And uh, so he had a, a, a physical condition that changed uh, his, his uh, appearance, and uh, he was in a lot of horror movies and B-movies. Uh, he was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, yeah. and actually the time of recording the... Uh, the person who directed that just passed away. What was yes, his name? Yes, Milos Foreman. He just died yeah. yesterday. But he wasn't Sloth in the Goonies? I'm the double picture check. I'm looking at over your shoulder, I'm pretty sure he was Sloth. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to look this up here. Uh, he was in The Crow. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm not seeing it here. This is really... Killing me. So they're going back to Pacifica. Did this ship blow up yet? Not yet. They're gonna find yet. the debris of the. That's ship. the. That's when it starts getting interesting yeah. for me. But there, are every everybody else on this in the crew that doesn't know that this is going on is like, when are we gonna get to the ocean planet? <laughs> I want to go swimming. This is where we need Wesley and some of his yeah. friends. He's all like. We're gonna we're gonna pull in real tight. I'm gonna jump off the back of the Enterprise. It's gonna be awesome. So this guy was also uh, the the man we're talking about here, Berryman. He was in Star Trek V. He was one of Cybox uh, uh, warriors. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, we'll be talking about Star Trek V next year. And he was in Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home. Uh, as a Starfleet display officer. Now, this episode also has a number of props from the Voyage Home, yeah. too. So now, uh, so now Crusher knows about what happened. Even though he wasn't supposed to talk about the meeting. And... How did she find out? Yeah. Because she, she saw that the... Uh, that the ship was in orbit? Yeah. Or somebody, that's right, no, somebody told her, that's right. Some some unknown person told her that it was there. So this is a pretty open secret among the senior staff of the Enterprise. Sorry, I must have missed it. Did they say that the Code 47 came from Captain Walker? Or Yes. yes okay. Yeah. So Which he was not, so which he, apparently you're not supposed to use it to do what he did. So they're, they're going to this sector... And they're about to find the remains of this ship that. Uh, Walker's ship. 
that exploded. And in this, in the meeting, what we kind of talked over was Walker was suspicious of, suspicious of his first officer. And so what they're implying is that maybe the first officer exploded the ship. Blowed him up real good. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, makeup supervisor, uh, Michael Westmore, um, was uh, an old school friend uh, of uh, Cliff Boyle, the uh, director. So uh, in the scene where Remick at the end, uh, there's a there's kind of a funny story to tell there. Um, so Westmore had a lot of fun uh, with this episode because there's a number of special effects and makeup that they had to do. I really, really, really can't wait till we get to the last three minutes of the sh- episode. <laughs> yeah. Now, what this is this? This is a hard blow. Yeah. To both Picard and Crusher, because that's their old friend. Yeah, that's the guy a... that introduced Crusher to her husband. Mm-hmm. Now you think normally they'd hang out and do a. An investigation. Oh, we just found this blowed up ship. Moving on. Well, maybe they didn't Which report it have... because they thought there was yeah. a conspiracy going on, and so the higher ups would already know that it's blown up. Right. So now he's te- now he's being specific with Riker about what's going on since that ship blew up. Oh, oh this data. is this is really cool. I was talking to myself. <laughs> talking to myself, like you just said. <laughs> There's a lot of leaps and bounds in this on Data's quest to become human. He's, yeah. yeah. I think it's funny how one computer is explaining to another computer the 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 oddities of of doing random things as a human being. Right. And then the computer just shuts him up and says, thank you, you've explained it enough. This is taken to a fun extreme on Futurama with uh, where Bender and the computer fall in love with uh, Bender and the ship's computer fall in love with one another. That's right. Looks like uh, Brent Spiner there is uh, wearing a little bit of eyeshadow there, too. Could be. I'm in this thing. So, Data's about to lay it down. He's found a pattern. This is great, because he's about to make a map out of Data. I love how his investigation turns into literally a map with an arrow on it pointing to Earth. Anytime, because of uh, the movie Serenity, when Mm -hmm. people say the highest levels, I always think of that scene where they, for the beginning of the movie, where they kill the people that uh, programmed River. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's been examined by people from the highest levels. (laughs) Highest levels, you say. (laughs) Boy, that, watch that again. That series was really hack and slash. Even the movie yeah. too. So man, this is just killing me how slow we're going through these acts. We're not even, controversial, but I actually kind of like, like this scene here. I wait. think this is a completely CGI Enterprise right no, here. No, I don't this think so. This is not so. the model. What? That's not CGI. I think I've it seen. is. That does not look like a, the, It looked like it on the HD one too. It's weird and green. It looks like a computer representation. The top of it didn't look like the Enterprise normally looks. It's just a bunch of, like, pixels. I don't know. Yeah. We'll have to research that and get back yeah. to you. You were about but, to say something, Nigel. Oh, uh, I don't know. I kind of like I kind of like this slow-moving part just because we don't see Riker and Picard at odds too often in these early episodes, but you can kind of get the from uh, Riker's acting here that 
he doesn't he's not fully on board here because he's the career officer. He wants to be a captain one day, and he's being told that the higher ups are all corrupt. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. I thought I thought it was good acting on that part. Well, I he, agree. He has to make a choice at yes. some point. Well, do I go with the captain or do I go, I go with the bureaucracy? If he goes with the bureaucracy, his career is established. If he goes mm-hmm. with Picard, and that's a bad bet. Like Picard's part of a bad conspiracy, then his career is over. Yeah, I just thought that was kind of. This is the first easy. time we see planet Earth and, and Luna, as they like to call it, the moon. That's neat. That's neat. That's like, let's chart a course where we like fly over the surface of the moon to get there. And I like that the moon has been left kind of unspoiled. Yeah. So you're not looking up at the moon and seeing lights. Now, here's something very interesting. They, they open this communique by saying, so what's the flagship of the Federation just doing back home? Yeah. And, you know, when you look at the naval traditions, like understanding where a ship is supposed to go, uh, it's, it's confidential information. You're not supposed to really release your sailing schedule other than, hey, we plan to arrive at this port at a certain time. Uh, especially like with aircraft carriers, there was a big scandal about that where a gentleman was manipulating the course of an aircraft carrier to maximize um, the contract of goods he could sell to the military mm. for resupplying a port. So I would imagine that in this day and age, in this setting here, in next gen, the the enterprise would be following a course, and if they notice a course change. They would know days in advance that the Enterprise has, has changed course and they probably would want to have that communication with them on subspace. Yeah. Hey, why are you coming home when you're all the way out there by usually the neutral zone or something like that? Well, a lot of things don't make sense about this if you look, if you look too close. Yeah. But it's TV. Yeah. But I think uh, this Admiral in the center here is the first Vulcan that we have seen on... Um, or no, it's not, because no. there was a Vulcan in Coming of Age. Yep. And there was a Vulcan, a non-speaking Vulcan part, I think, in the first couple of episodes. I, I remember calling it out a while ago. So we we kind of talked over, oh, here's this is actually Earth. from a movie. Star Trek IV. Uh, yep. Uh, that would be the... Which would come out the, in 1986. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's uh, Admiral Quinn. It's also the last episode we see this admiral's uniform, too. Yeah, and the Chef, who's the regular admiral that we'll end up dealing with, has a much more conservative uniform than these admirals do. Yeah. Mm, they get rid of that triangle pattern there on the shoulder for rank. They just go to the four pips. I really liked... Remick as the bad guy. They should have kept him. I agree. Like, how cool would it be if he just chimed in every now and then and, like, he was the bureaucrat in Starfleet that gave the crew the hard time? Well, I like the Chaev, too, who I, I'm trying to think how many episodes she's in, but she's the she's definitely Picard's harshest critic yeah. in the future. Well, she also gave Cisco a run for his money. Uh, the, the thing with the Chaev, though, we don't see her until, like, what the fifth season yeah. something like that there's a great there's a great line coming up with Quinn where he's fighting Worf and he says vitamins yeah. does wonders for the body yeah. I, I love it I mean that's now the episode's starting to heat up I'm, I'm very excited Or again, uh, <laughs> leggy, some leggy ladies. We gotta, we gotta use these costumes before we have to throw them out. It's like I swear, it's like it, there's like this 1960s type guy, like just goes out of the streets of Burbank, California, where they filmed this, and it's like, hey, girls, wanna be on TV? Okay, and they all run. <laughs> I, I, I love how he talks about what the actual problem is. It's with assimilating new species into the Federation. Who? Uh, Quinn? Quinn, yeah. He Just says to touch to, back to coming of age. Yeah. They've got the 
creepy music going on. And I, what I kind of wish they'd played off in here is that what they had wanted for Picard was for him to be um, the commandant of Starfleet Academy. Yeah, to they have been want... on Earth to have been on Earth this whole time. So for about six episodes, oh, Little League model Star Trek. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Star Trek. Uh, time that passes in the episodes. So six episodes have gone by since we saw Quinn and Remick. How much time in in, in uh, Star Trek world has passed? A few months? A few weeks? I would imagine a few months. This is where it kills me that I'm not a hardcore fan, because if I was smart, I would have looked up the difference in star dates. I was trying to post to our uh, Facebook page, there's a uh, star date calculator app. Oh, a, a star date calculator? Yeah, you put it in, it'll tell you the actual day and year. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So that little uh, creature that we saw in Quinn's laptop bag, I guess, for all intents and purposes. Um, that was designed by uh, Makeup and Effects Laboratories. Uh, so Michael Westmore, did he work on it? Does it say? No, a gentleman by the name of Rick Sternbeck. Huh. And he is an illustrator who's known best for uh, space illustration work in this oh, cool. show, by the way. Probably did the, those paintings that are on the wall there. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that looks like a bad Photoshop right I know. there. <laughs> Gi- it's like giant walnut, if that's what they call that one. <laughs> That is just a terrible uh, headquarters building. They could have done so much better. That's actually a very realistic earth shot there. Yeah. So this desk is also Cisco's desk for uh, a couple of episodes in Deep Space Nine. He's got some wings to that desk, though, because his desk is pretty... Cisco's well, desk is a lot bigger than that. It's guy's not desk. the desk on Deep Space Nine. It's, uh, like, on the station itself. It's when he was reassigned. They uh-huh. just swapped out the top uh it was also that desk was also used in one of the movies too if i remember correctly superior form of life it does (laughs) like you (laughs) yeah it immediately goes now we're right into horror movie territory there's the line. He said it. Yeah, oh, and for, and for some reason, Riker decides to strike the Admiral. All right, was that an accurate kick? Uh, it was not an effective kick, but, I mean, I wouldn't personally recommend it, but clearly it worked. I mean, they, they fight weird in Star Trek. I mean, Kirk's whole thing is like running at a guy and then jumping at him with both feet. So. Or the double fist punch, yeah. like where you clasp your hands together. Another jump kick. High kicks. Roundhouse. High kicks. High kicks. Well, I think the idea oh. was, what is the likelihood you would have a glass coffee table anywhere on a starship? Yeah. Just the look. Yeah. I think the effect they were going for with the kind of fighting. That's a this, long conversation there. Those people have been talking every time they. Well, the sorry. sun is shining. <laughs> the day is nice. Nigel, I apologize. I, inter- I interrupted you right in the middle no. of what you were saying. That's totally fine. I think the, they use wide, wider looping punches, big dramatic kicks just for the effect more so than the practicality. Mm-hmm. It needs to look good and to sell and to sell the effect on the audience more so than more practicality. That was just something that I noticed with Yar whenever she's doing any martial arts. It's much more cut, much more focused, much more to the point, which is what any good martial artist would actually recommend. Ah, okay. Uh, if you notice that uh, they just walk through ten forwards doors, uh, they they use those doors further on. Not that blue one in the back, but you know the classic wood panel. Yes. Uh, Which doors. I love. I mean, if I if I had my druthers I, and I could have like a little bar in my house, I would have the swinging doors with the Starfleet emblem. So this right here, I remember this scene as a kid, and I knew that Picard. Watching this as a kid, I knew Picard had to pretend like he didn't suspect anything. And then what happened was Picard was asked to drink. And that him taking a drink would betray whether or not he knew something was wrong or not. 
Like, do I do it? I mean, is there something in this or not? It's not really the color of anything I would want to drink either. Yeah. Now, that, I thought that this was really dumb of the Admiral. He had an out. Yeah, he, he did. He didn't have to totally attack Jordy. Totally himself away. Oh, so now he gets to fight a Klingon. Yeah. Worf's like, oh, it's on like Donkey Kong. Let's go. This is exactly what Worf wants. I'm going to kick your butt. But it's like, you, you also feel like, you know, for the only honorable member of a culture that's all about honor, that he would be like, you are free more than old. <laughs> <laughs> I will not fight you. <laughs> but no. And again, see the double fist throw there. Do Klingon fear death as much as humans? I could snap your neck in a second. But it wouldn't be as much fun. I'm really surprised how little Worf is talking in this scene. Well, he's growling. He's yeah. fierce. Maybe that's not something. Yes. Oh. And who gets him? Yeah. Uh, this this is a great moment for Crusher. Because remember the last time she was holding a phaser? She was holding it like it was yeah. going to bite her or something. And that was a commentary about women and guns. Yeah, well, let's let's imagine that after that happened, she's like, I'm super embarrassed about what happened with Lore. And went and had a conversation with Tasha Yar and was like, Tasha, how do I do this right? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, I just love the fact that she knew how to use the weapon, and mm. she used it on the Admiral, and there was no question about it. Uh, the 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 thimble that that, that um, the the weak wristed I'm afraid of things woman that they portrayed her those so many episodes yep. ago. I'm glad she, that that character is gone. Yeah, if Wesley could see her now. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yeah. That so so they knocked Quinn unconscious. Oh, and she's going to see this thorn, right? Is it a thorn? Yeah, what is it's it? a, it, she calls it a gill. Calls it a blue gill. Whew! Ugh. I know, so, so I, creepy. I didn't buy this for a second. I was thinking, you know, anyone would notice that if you're just walking down the hallway. Would you? This thing's sticking out of your neck, yeah. Because you think we'd be able to see that right there in this scene. You can see the back of his neck. Well, the other side, probably, yeah. Oh, of course. It's always on the side that's not facing you. That's how it hides. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Dinner is served. Wonderful. Better the captain has given me quite an appetite. I need to contact my ship to let Commander White know his whereabouts. Of course. We'll wait for you at the door. And here, here about here is going to be the big um, cultural insensitivity section of this and I will use um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom as an example of why I find this sort of culturally insensitive. Mm, chilled monkey brains. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> we're going there, aren't we? No, no, I was thinking of when they're in the uh, Indian village. Oh, yeah, Not, when they're, at, not right. when they're at Pancot Palace, when they're at the Indian village along the river, him and Willie. I love this. This is love great. This. Oh. Great. Is this CGI? Yeah, that's yeah. CGI. That must have cost them so much money. Oh, there are the ten forward doors. Yep. So what they didn't resolve is uh, Quinn had a little critter with him in a little like laptop case. Yeah. They never account for that in this episode. So after the fight. And they have Quinn. Yeah. They don't say, hey, we have this creature here right. in containment. It just, it's a loose thread. They don't know it's there. That's true. It could just be well, living that would on be the a ship. That great, a great, uh, a great novel to follow this up with. No, not exactly, though. It, would it be spoiling if I mentioned that the beast, that the big queen dies at the end? Oh, yes. that's okay. right, because everybody out yeah. the other ones in the proximity die. Do they yeah. die when the queen yeah. dies? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're, we're now things are heating up, and um, when they were writing this, initially they wanted to try to tell a different type of story. 
Um, but what ended up was uh, people are saying it's not Star Trek. It's too dark. It has a dark ending. It's not a happy episode. Uh, and uh, somebody really loved the script and they basically pushed it through. And uh, it got to the point okay. where this episode actually so heard a couple of here's the card. Just be horrified. Oh, they're yeah. Grubs. Several cultures on Earth Earth, the the uh, human beings, yep. eat eat this. Yeah, <laughs> many many people eat like this right now, <laughs> and he's just disgusted by it. Yeah, it's like this. This should well, I mean, Ferengi eat grubs. Yeah, but yeah. but I'm saying human beings. <laughs> yeah, and that Vulcan, and they probably yeah. they probably taste good too. I mean, they're probably cooked well. I didn't know uh, bugs were on the menu, guys. Yeah. I I only eat Mexican food. Yeah. His reaction is totally inappropriate too. It is for him to openly it back is. It away. It makes me think of of Willie Lee in uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom in the village where they they feed her this food and she's just disgusted by it. Yep. And Indiana Jones is like, "This is more food than they eat in a you know in a week." That they've given you, and you're acting insulted by it. So they gave him a gill, a wimpy looking gill, by that. The doctor will be joining us soon. So for them to just be open with Picard on this is really strange. Like, I don't even understand the point of why they all are meeting right there. Well, because they've got who we already had established was, you know, the fastest rising in the ranks captain. Oh, and so he just said that we invited you to find us. So maybe they wanted to catch Picard to either flip him or eliminate him. Yeah. Because Picard would be one of the people who would fight. Yeah. These are their two most important captains right here. Uh, a book actually went to suggest that these creatures inhabiting all of these folks are a uh, an adaptation of a trill, which dum, da, dum, dum, dum. we just thought were kind of just, just yeah. ridiculous. Like, what the heck are you smoking? So, Nigel, do you Trill. remember the trills? Uh, I don't think I saw the episode. All right, so trills, it's a slug that lives in your body, in your stomach, and it's a symbiotic relationship. The trill lasts, lives for hundreds of years uh-huh. and is transplanted from host to host to host. And uh, a very popular character by the name of Dax on Deep Space Nine was based off of the species. What's and again, cool action shooting during dinner time. But again, you know, wow, nice animation. That's the first Vulcan neck pinch we see in Next Gen. So is she okay then? Uh, I think they're all dead. Because when you, because later on, if you fire a phaser to, that's set to kill, it just vaporizes the person. Yeah. Why would he stop and look? Yeah. That's just. Oh. There he goes. There goes his kidneys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be peeing barbecue for the next couple of days. Nice effect. It is a really nice effect. Yeah. Now, that's the smartest thing they've done. They followed it. This map of the Federation. How cool is that? That is awesome. I mean, it's pretty basic. For some reason, they have the same map on two walls. That chair? We've seen that chair? That's the $10,000 chair from... uh, Too Short a Season. Yeah, that's right. The Admiral sat in. Now, here's an opportunity for them to be really di- diplomatic with Remick, you know? It's. But Love be- this off oh, stop yeah. motion. It's stop great. Motion. Ah, look it. So, this right here, this is a hilarious scene. So, Remick is wearing a fake neck. And not the, quite yet. Not yet, but he will be. And the, the makeup guy is breathing into a tube and trying to hyperventilate himself to expand 
this this neck thing that he's wearing. There it goes. Yeah, that's a good effect. And and so the director and the makeup guy uh, were old f- school buddies. So the director was trying to make uh, he was trying to mess with <laughs> with the guy blown in the tube, trying to get him to pass out and hyperventilate. <laughs> Oh, down he goes. All right. Oh, that was awesome. That meat explosion was actually a mold of Paul Newman filled with meat and exploded. If you can believe it. This, I mean, this is just scarier than anything they've ever had before since on Star Trek. Oh, yeah. This critter that just screams. And they're just like, it's ugly, kill it. It's not Star Trek. Yeah, they it would, really is. They would they would want to talk to it. You know, put it in a transporter beam, study it on the ship. Yeah, get a uh, you know xenobiologist in to look at it. This episode actually, they had a really hard time releasing this. Uh, I think in the UK they had to do a a warning of graphic violence before. Will Wheaton was not seen in this episode. Nope. Will Wheaton hasn't been seen in a few episodes. The the Vulcan, uh, Henry Darrow, the Vulcan ambassador. Actually, we see him in a lot of Star Trek, a lot of Voyager, actually. So they plant a seed of a script that never happens. Oh, well, it never happens? I like and, to imagine that... Uh, I mean, they, they don't follow through on they it. They wanted yeah. the Borg when they originally wanted we're going to do the Borg. The Borg were going to be like insects. Really? So yeah, I like to imagine that this was just the... They were setting up the Borg in this, and then when they got the Borg, realized they couldn't do them like that. Because here is a really creepy signal yeah. coming out saying, Come to Earth. Come to Earth. Yeah. Come to Earth. They got great bugs here. I know. Yeah, right? And they they just never... I never realized it. Because they had two episodes to set up a really good story arc. And it just killed me they didn't follow through on it. Just like with the Ferengi, too. They yeah. drip feed the Ferengi for the first five or six episodes. And then it turns out, oh, it didn't work out. So shall we rate this? Yeah. Nigel, I'll let you go first. Yeah. I almost think that this needs two separate rating systems. One is a Star Trek Next Generation episode. One is a good sci-fi episode. Because mm. by sci-fi standards, this is a very classic space opera kind of Invasion of the Body Snatchers kind of episode. To which case I give it a 10 out of 10 exploding mm-hmm. Remick heads. Yes. As a Star Trek episode, I feel like that I can only give it a 5 out of 10 exploding Remick heads because... There was a lot of potential that they could have done with it. We see Crusher. Crusher is the unsung hero of this episode. She recommended the winning strategy. She oh, saved everybody. You are right. And I feel like that didn't really go anywhere. I mean, and I, I almost wanted more from Remick because in the last episode we see him in, he's the aspiring hierarchy ladder climbing guy. Uh huh. And. He literally sold his sold his soul to the bad aliens in order to become powerful in this one. He's the guy who's sending out the message. I just feel like there's a lot of potential with this episode that was unrealized, but it was a good Star Trek episode. I'm not sure I agree that it's beyond what was normal, but I don't know. I'd give it a 5 out of 5 as a Star Trek episode. As a good sci-fi slash horror sh- episode, I'd give it a good 10 out of 10. I love your analysis, Nigel. It's that that is so well put, uh, especially with the part of Crusher's young son, yes. unsung hero. Yes. She she provides the initial intervention with Quinn in the fight. She discovers the gill. Oh. She has the the dupe strategy, and then really the only the only thing that Picard and Riker did was they were the muscle, mm-hmm. basically that that tied up the loose end. 
Uh, you, you're absolutely right. I would have loved to see a whole backstory. That actually could be a great novel. Following Remig, how he discovered this queen and how that deal went down. Yes. Was he, com- was he forced? Was he compelled to? Like, what, what are the circumstances behind that? Yeah, there's so much that could have, they could have done with this. So, so sci-fi-wise, yes. You, I would have to agree with you. Uh, 10 out of 10 exploding Remig heads for the sci-fi component. For the Star Trek component, as, as memorable as it was and as graphic as it was, I'm going to give it a very low score. Maybe only three, three and a half exploding Remig heads for, for a next-gen story. Because it's not next-gen. No. It's not yeah. Star Trek. It's not how... Star Trek never resolves its plot with violence without some kind of context or follow-up. True. True. Uh, Pat said it perfectly when, at the final scene, we, when we saw the Queen, he, the response was, that's ugly, let's shoot it. Uh, the same response with the bugs. Mm. This is ugly. It, it, it's too weird. It's not for us. The only thing that that this episode shows... So in the first two to three seasons of Star Trek, if it's not human, it's foreign and it should be feared. Mm-hmm. And, more or less. More. And this kind of substantiates that. And I never liked that about Star Trek. I loved in the last three seasons, they celebrate diversity. They're trying to look for alternatives to violence. And more creative solutions. So this, it actually would have been a good original series. Uh, yeah. Show. Yes. And all that they needed to say was with uh, Picard not wanting to eat the bugs, that there was a smell to it that was like it's obviously not fit for human consumption. Yeah. They could have. Yeah. They could have just did one little twist. Yeah. But you also have to. What era is this coming from? Nineteen eighty-eight. It's the materialistic era where fitting in and making sense and you are one of us. Mm-hmm. So the it's writing to that culture of you're not something's not playing the part, so there must be something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how about you, uh, Pat? How would you score this? Um, as a, as just an episode of the first season of Star Trek: The Next Generation. I mean, the best is definitely yet to come, but it's up there with uh, Arsenal of Freedom and. Uh, the ship, which I really like. Um, so for season one, probably four out of five. For Star Trek in general, you know, two or three. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, it's it's one of the best of season one. Well, it's the second to the last episode. Yep. It but should have been the last. I think the last episode should have come before this and this should have ended yeah. the season. I'm sorry, did you give this an exploding head score at all? Exploding head score, well, for exploding heads, I mean, we already scanners have already come out. Scanners have been about six years before this, so that had the best exploding head of the eighties. But this might be the second best exploding head of the eighties. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, so this is the second to the last episode for season one for Next Generation's first generation. And we've had a lot of fun refu- reviewing uh, where this will be the 24th, 25th episode yep. for us. We'll do one more neutral zone, and then we're going to take a, a shore leave break. Uh, so could you explain to the listeners what shore leave is all about, Pat? So shore leave is going to be a monthly series. Um, there might be two episodes in a month because we're going to look at seven films from the year 1988. And why are we doing films and not doing the second season right away? Because there was a writer's strike going on at this time. So it took forever for Next Generation to come back. And we didn't want you to wait six months for new episodes of our show. Yeah, that's right. But we also want to hold near and dear to the 30-year anniversary. So we picked a number of films that some of us have seen, some of us we have not seen, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing, like, for example, I think, what, Alien Nation is in there. Alien Nation is in there. Yeah. Uh, Big with Tom Hanks turns 30 this year. Yeah. Uh, Beetlejuice is 30. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. Willow is 30. Willow. Which is fun because uh, the director of that, Ron Howard, is doing another Lucasfilm movie this year, the Han Solo movie. So it'll be fun to kind of compare... 
you know, his second Lucasfilm movie to his first Lucasfilm movie. Um, we're going to go a little bit raunchy and do uh, The Naked Gun. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. And uh, I think we will bring uh, Alex back for that. Um, what else is on the on the list? Um, I well, know I'm missing some. I'm, that's I'm all right. We don't yeah. want to give out all the spoilers. <laughs> yeah. So uh, please join us for this movie review. It's called the Shore Leaves series. Uh, we'll also have some promos and plugs for some other shows that we recommend you listen to. Uh, while we're on our break, you can always email us at uh, what was Next it? Generation First Generation it, Pod at gmail dot com. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. We want to thank uh, thank Nigel for joining us anytime. And I want to give a special shout out to another show that covered this episode um, conspiracy. A couple of years ago, it's the podcast, um, I'm blanking on the name of it now, Star Trek Monthly Mondays over at Two True Freaks. Mm, Scott okay. and Scott Gardner and Chris Honeywell did a really interesting analysis of conspiracy. If you want to get, you know, into the mindset of people who were in college when this episode came out and weren't kids when they first saw it. Oh, there you go. Well, very cool. All right. Well, with that being said, we're going to wrap this up. We have another, one more really wonderful ex- episode for you coming up next. I believe that is Neutral Zone. That is actually one of uh, one of my uh, favorite ones coming up. So until then, I'd like to say have a wonderful day. So you're the guest. So Sasha, what's so, a Star Trek? Hi, I'm the guest. So Sasha, what is Star Trek? <laughs> We're only in the first season right now, so there's a lot that's coming down the line. Seek us out at Next Generation's First Generation at iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Music credits include Electric Car by Potting to Bear. Music heard in this podcast can be found at freemusicarchive.org. Audio engineering by Sasha Shouties. Chief meme maker and episode cover credit goes to Matthew Kirshner. Logo and graphic art design credit goes to David Clawwitter. And special thanks to Patrick Delmore for working with other podcasts to make sure the good work gets out. Do you have a podcast that you think people should be listening to? Send us your promos and we'll play them on the show. If you'd like to email the show, you can email us at nextgenfirstgenpod at gmail.com. I've been Patrick Delmore. And this is Sasha Shouties. Thank you very much for listening, and have a wonderful day. Good night.